morning, Anne. I hope you don't mind us coming in the back way, but we saw Martin up a tree. <laughs> Two of the more memorable characters in the series were Howard and Hilda Hughes. Naive, infuriating and a little bit odd. Hey up, lad. My name is Nathan Sidebottom. <laughs> you see, I'm becoming terrified that I'm being touched by dark forces. Both Geraldine Newman and Stanley Labour came from the theatre and had small parts in a number of TV series such as Dr Finley's Casebook and The Naked Civil Servant. But their big break came when they were offered the parts of devoted couple Howard and Hilda. <laughs> Just a minute, Howard. Just a minute, Hilda. Guess what? Howard and Hilda were amazing because they were both mad. <laughs> Howard and Hilda were part of a world that Martin could control before Paul had come along and disrupted it. Howard, um, a simple man, um, an enthusiast. I used to think that a jacuzzi was a little hopping animal, you know. <laughs> Howard is a kind of disciple to Martin. He sort of uh, will do whatever Martin asks him to do, and Hilda tags along. Howard and Hilda, you really are a couple of funny old buckets. <laughs> They're the sort of couple who, in real life, you'd probably find deeply frustrating. They also wore exactly the same clothes. They both were like Hilda. twins. But it's not always pleasant when someone comes up to you and says, oh, I love your matching costumes, and you think, what about my acting? Yes. My, my yes. costumes. <laughs> I can see it's going to be one of those days when you keep me laughing endlessly. <laughs> <laughs> the only thing I think I put to them was that I, I said, you ought to be wearing the same clothes somehow or other. Well, we talked about this before, didn't we? And uh, uh, I, I, Geraldine I thinks that it was her idea. It was my idea. May they find great happiness in their new home. And garden. And garden. <laughs> it may have been, I may have just thought of it at the same time. With the cast now in place, there was still one important ingredient missing for a hit series, an attention-grabbing title. May I have a seconder? He does try. Yours in haste. Titles are always terribly difficult, terribly difficult. We went through something like 39 titles. E equals MC squared was one of them. Um, oh, I can't tell you the trouble we had. Ever-decreasing circles. After much head-scratching, the writers settled on the cryptic ever-decreasing circles, a canny reference to Martin's tendency to disappear into his own anal little world. All I said was, why were there molehills on my lawn and not on Paul's? You did not. You claimed the moles knew which lawn was which. <laughs> You claim that they had decided not to dig hills on Paul's lawn. The competition between uh, Martin uh, and uh, uh, Peter's part uh, was that Egan's part was good at everything. He was what they called at school an all-rounder. He would be very good at mathematics, he'd be very good at football, be very good at cricket. My favourite episode was the cricket match. It was only during filming they discovered a potential problem in that Peter Egan, unlike his character, couldn't actually play cricket. Sidney Lotterby, uh, he was terribly worried. And he said, he can't play cricket, he can't, he's no good. He can't play cricket. And we thought, I said, well, can't you do some magic with the camera? I mean, can't you do something? Uh, and then somebody said, you know, put some music on the top. It was wonderful, whatever, with this great man doing his great, whoa, you know, and it looked like wonderful, he looked like a great batsman. And it worked a treat. But for Martin, it was his worst nightmare. It was like cutting him through with a knife. He, the captain, he, the man who had arranged all the teas, he, the man who had varnished the stumps, and his wife, trying to make it all all right for him, said, look, Never mind, you're good at playing the piano. You go in next door to the bar and give us a tune on the piano. 
You've always been good at that. They like that. You know they do. And he says, yes, I am good at that. And at that very moment, through the door, you hear, da dun da dun 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 <laughs> Yes, it is him. <laughs> the question that was also asked an awful lot was about the relationship between um, Paul and Anne, Martin's wife, and you know, because the, there was always a teasing kind of relationship. Tricky, isn't it? Oh, that's difficult. Yes. Yeah. When you come to think of it, you see, it's not well, so, so easy. Many of them. Yeah, take your time, take your time. <laughs> it's a sort of odd situation. There's a single man, and then sometimes he's rather flirty with me, and then you wonder whether I'll go off with. So there's constant. There was a constant sort of interest in that area. And I seem to remember somewhere that um, in the first series there was a final episode where um, uh, Paul and Anne actually eloped together. And, of course, uh, by the time we got to the fourth episode of the first series, they realised that would be a total disaster, so it was never made. Um, but so that kind of underlying um, tease was always kind of threaded through the whole series. One of these days... I'm going to call your bluff. Who's bluffing? <laughs> Slightly disappointing audiences of around five million watched the first series of Ever Decreasing Circles. The BBC would have expected more, but they were willing to give the series every possible chance of success. They decided to go for a second series, so they repeated the first series again, and the repeats of the first series got seven million which is also quite remarkable, because then the, the people who had seen the first series talked about it, and more people watched the second series. The second series itself got nine million. <laughs> Anybody ever got 147 here? Yeah? No. Mm. And then it went from nine million to 11 million to 13, 15, 7, and it was just fantastic, just wonderful. <laughs> That's four away. That's four away! After the second series, the cast realised the show was a hit. But when they returned for series three, there had been an unexpected change in personnel. Director Sidney Lotterby had left. I don't know why Sidney left. I don't know. I left because I was given a sack. I was called into the office one day out of the blue and told that... Um, I wasn't giving enough direction to uh, our principal actor. It hurt at the time, but there we are. Sydney had been replaced by Harold Snowd, another of the BBC's most prolific and reliable comedy directors. Sydney, I th always thought by nature, was an introvert, which is um, ra rather uh, funny considering the amount of wonderful comedy he's produced. And Harold is an, an extrovert. And so it was just a basic change of energy, I think. Harold's first major sitcom was Oh Brother, starring Derek Nimmo in 1968. The following year, he directed Dad's Army, before moving on to Are You Being Served? In 1978, Harold worked with writer Richard Waring on the series Rings on Their Fingers, then helped the Doctor's sitcom Don't Wait Up continue its smooth run through the 80s. He brought his experience and energy to an increasingly popular show. 